Go ahead. Yes, my name is Jerry Haas, and I'm a, a TV producer. Um, <laughs> Let's see, a politician. I'm, I, I have decided to, to run for president, so I'm you know, undecided yet. You can, uh, I'm the no name party. In fact, my name is no name. My last name is no name. No, I'm just kidding. All right, so now we'll start again, okay? <laughs> you, you can edit that part out. Well, no. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, friends, I'm delighted that uh, Dr. Tom Becker is with us today. Uh, Tom is somebody I've known through a variety of things, but primarily with the Border Community Alliance. Uh, we've worked together on some things in relationship to the border. Um, Tom also has um, attended our church some here. We've been in study groups together. He's somebody I appreciate a lot for the wisdom he brings, uh, his travels in Latin America, the work that he has in the business community, and uh, his overall um, commitment in life to, to growing and learning is just really commendable. So I'm really, really glad that uh, Tom was willing to be here. Uh, I would also say that um, we had the chance to get to know Diane a little bit, his wife, uh, before she passed away, and uh, we're very grateful um, for, the, for the, the work that I know went into caring for her um, through Tom and others. So here we are, and uh, Tom, I'll turn it over to you, and thank you again for coming today. Well, thank you, Jerry, and uh, I have to tell you, I have new hearing aids, so they're just two days old. Yeah, so I could, I could hear and understand everything Jerry said. So Jerry, you're, you're safe, you're still in the payroll. For those flattering comments. And Jerry asked me to uh, uh, give a summary of, of uh, following uh, Linda Laird's presentation. Um, her role was a caretaker, caregiver for her husband. And uh, Jerry thought a uh, male perspective on caregiving would be useful, and that's why I'm here. And I have to tell you, I just came from lunch. I get together with a, uh, a group of men uh, once a month. And, and uh, today was the day. And we decided we'd go around the table because we really didn't know each other that well. What happened to us? Each of us would recount what, uh, what recently occurred in our lives. I said, well, I had uh, lost my wife to Alzheimer's eight months ago. And our 60th anniversary would have been three months ago, and that uh, 14 months ago, before my wife entered memory care, I was a wreck emotionally and physically. And now I'm in pretty decent shape, and I think I can identify with what many of you are going through, and I hope that my transition uh, will help you make the same transition. As I walked, uh, I organized this chat into six stages. And what I call the, the pre-diagnosis, the diagnosis, the memory care decision, the memory care of life, and then life after, after memory care. Uh, <clears throat> I walked each of those stages and you're walking one or more of them now. If you uh, if you if you haven't uh, faced a particular one, maybe you've already passed it. So I'm hoping that some of what I have to say today is going to help you help you through with that in that sense. And in some abstracted sense, uh, I might be introducing yourself today to your future self. And in that sense, I hope that the uh, philosophical perspective might help make the difference between choices you make today, which you ultimately find satisfactory, and those which you will regret. Because uh, I've been through many of those choices, and that's what I want to share with you. So the first stage is, is uh, life before diagnosis. And that I had it all. We had, uh, had health, we had no crippling financial constraints. 
We cruised or otherwise visited some 90 countries and homes in New Mexico and Arizona. Uh, even had uh, uh, a series of dozen or more airplanes, which happened to be a side business. We weren't that long. It was a business. But I'll mention that my career and my careers in U.S. Foreign Service and business and academia and consulting kept me busier living in 22 countries. Uh, too often, I was away from home. Each of our three children was born in a different country, and our last move was number 31. Uh, and sometimes I wonder if that impermanent lifestyle might have somehow contributed to Diane's Alzheimer's. Because much of what I've read and heard since stresses the importance of maintaining a stable lifestyle. So that's part of my guilt trip. We'll visit some other grounds next time. Diane was, was mentally alert. Uh, she was always learning to learn. Had two master's degree, good Spanish, she had international pitch master points, a Cambridge diploma in English as a second language. She was head of the English department at the American School in Honduras. Uh, and she was an American actually allowed to teach English at the British School in Peru. Uh, I took that as a badge of Anglophone honor, uh, a rare distinction. But uh, there surfaced some disturbing incidents involving memory and logic. Here's just a handful of examples from minor to more concerning incidents. Uh, misplacing car keys, misplacing eyeglasses, misplacing prescription medicines. That's concerning, but not, uh, not disabling. It really got my attention one day when she called home from the hairdressers and couldn't find her way back home and wanted directions. Uh, that got my attention. And what really got my attention was one day we were driving uh, through the Salt River Canyon, and Diane was in the passing line, and I noticed in the side view here a lot of cars behind us, I said, I don't want you to pull over into the slow lane. Said, no, I'm not going to. <laughs> and this was so out of character that it, it, uh, it caught my attention, concerned me. So I said I was going to list some questions and some lessons learned. Here's a question. When you notice changes in the behavior of your loved one, how do you know what is normal and age-related and what could be a first warning signal of dementia? First lesson learned. I kick myself now when I recall all those telltale symptoms which preceded Diane's formal diagnosis of Alzheimer's. And those symptoms preceded that diagnosis by 10 or more years. And if I hadn't dismissed them as being inconsequential quirks of behavior, earlier treatment might have forestalled or even prevented the onset of more severe symptoms. Would it have given us more lead time so she still might have been present and alive when the much promised Alzheimer's miracle drug was finally available. Second lesson learned. If you're here, this pre-diagnosis stage, uh, and lesson may not apply to you, but I'll mention it anyway so you can pass it on to others. It's simple. Don't allow yourself to reach the point in life where you regret not having done the things that the aftermath of those first warning signals now dictates that you can no longer do. Do it now. If you don't fly first class, your kids will. <coughs> Second stage is a diagnosis. This is tough. You know, saying let's 
let's go take a hike tomorrow. We're saying, well, let's, let's have some Mexican food tonight is very dramatically different than saying, let's have you tested for Alzheimer's, honey. <laughs> so here's the question. How do you tell your loved one that he or she should have a neurological examination? Well, I was lucky. I had a friend who was head of neurology at the University of New Mexico <coughs> Hospital, and he answered my call for help and cooperated in a, a key way that uh, really took me over the bridge. He invited both Diane and I to participate in a random controlled study he was conducting on brain health. Because the study results later showed an anomaly for Diane, he asked, would she be okay with further testing? So it helped remove me from the equation and help remove the initial stigma and resistance that she certainly would have reacted with had I been the suggestion. And later on, I found this a common problem. And that most primary care physicians are prepared to act as that third party authority and to break the, the, the uh, the wall between you and your and your loved one. So count on that. Uh, how do you post that? Uh, can you say that? What did you just say? Mm -hmm. that the, say that it again. Person, yeah. Oh yes, yeah. Most most uh, most most physicians, but particularly your primary care, are prepared to offer that advice to your loved one that he or she can that your primary care physician believes that he or she should have a neurological examination just for good health purposes. And I couldn't say that and get away with it, not successfully, you may not be able to, but they're there for a purpose and it's not like you're going to be the first person to request that of them. They're, they're used to it. A third stage, and this is the longest one. Probably many of you are in that now. I call it life after diagnosis. files 
but it's very few actionable results. So you're mostly on your own. And an example, my question to a neurologist after we've been in this for a year or more, well, why do you continue to prescribe, to prescribe melantine if it's been demonstrated to have no or inconsequential effects after one year? Well, because it's the only medicine which is approved. And I had like a $35 copay to hear that. Uh, that's about the level of, of, of knowledge that you'll find unless you go out of your way to manage it yourself. Uh, <clears throat> once again, I was lucky. My children, especially my two daughters, one is an RN, registered nurse, and one is a certified holistic health practitioner provider. They became the best advisors ever to their clueless dad. And they led the fight to try to save their mom. I can't support this empirically, but I'm really convinced that their health and findings markedly slowed the rate of decline of my wife. Uh, I'm going to show you what they, what they came up with. I don't Problem copying is first. Uh, I'll, I'll pass this around and let you take a look at it. But it's a it's a detailed, meticulous, and disciplined. I just know they had it in them. I mean, I'm the one with the PhD. But they did a uh, they just did a hell of a job with with uh, surveying what was available out there and. Along the way, I learned, I learned some. And what I learned about diet and supplements, uh, and I'll try to summarize what I think is most useful about this, uh, <clears throat> was that they're effective at an early stage. The sooner you take action, don't wait to see what's going to happen in a month or two months from now. If, if you're on a subject that looks like it holds some promise, and doesn't, isn't likely to have any unsafe, adverse side effects, well, jump on it. No way. There's a clock sticking. All right, here's my, uh, what I keep my head. All anti-inflammatories, including a ketogenic diet, which is sugar-free, dairy-free, gluten-free, but the most useful part of it is sugar-free. It's used to treat diabetics. And I recently read that Alzheimer's is now being considered by some physicians as diabetes type 3. It's that close of an association. Uh, a diet benefited me. I made some needed weight loss and felt much more alert, which I needed to feel and much more energetic. So, ketogenic diet, uh, long beta curcumin. This is interesting. Uh, curcumin is the basis of, curcumin is related to, to uh, turmeric. And we'll talk about turmeric. Uh, turmeric is on the list you have there. But their, uh, curcumin is, is a foundation ingredient of curry. And there's a Forbes article dealing with l serene which is closely related to curcumin. And uh, Forbes article of 14 pages. And Forbes is not the kind of publisher who capriciously will dedicate 14 pages to something which is, which is a flash in the pan in their view. Uh, this article, according to, the, according to a study of, I forget how many, but it's well over 100,000, a good sample size. Uh, the incidence of Alzheimer's among Indians who are fond of curry is 
I've got up in Oregon's in the same age group. It's, 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 it's dramatic. And the eventual love, Vermillion is a known anti inflammatory. That's effective. I, I still think. A long beta curcumin that may be three or four times more expensive, still about maybe a dollar a day, uh, but it has the advantage that it passes the brain barrier and its anti inflammatory effects can operate directly on the brain. So, long beta curcumin, uh, L serene, <coughs> fish oil supplements, and more recently, uh, pot, uh, CBD, which is in its non mood affecting uh, form, uh, CBD is found to be, is believed to be effective, and if, if anger is present, uh, THC, uh, the stuff that makes you high. Well, their research helped a lot, and all of it was relevant one way or another to the best single piece of advice I got from my neurologist friend. Anything which is good for cellular health is good for the brain. And I can't stress to you how, how pathogenic sugar is. Sugar is technically a poison. And it's, it's the one thing, avoid anything else, avoid sugar for your loved one. So, over the seven years since Diane's diagnosis, her demeanor went through a transition. She was, at the outset, uh, somewhat irritable. This is how she was still denying. She was somewhat irritable and argumentative for a phony couple of years. Uh, later, she became compliant, almost childlike open to suggestion. Uh, I found, I talked to others and found it, that Alzheimer's is like peeling an onion. Going layer after layer, they finally get down to the essence of what that person is. And in Diane's case, it was a childlike innocence and sweetness. Uh, the last several years of our marriage were the best years we had. Uh, yeah, it really, it was. We, uh, we, didn't, we didn't talk about it, but we knew we were sharing this, uh, this burden, and that we were both trying to make it work, and that uh, uh, she was, I, I would, Three friends now have been going through uh, the same experience as caregivers. And two of the cases, that, that will, that are all three male, uh, three, two of the three cases are still at the stage where their wife is argumentative and, and uh, very irritable. And it's making, making their life hell. Uh, last or not, it's very likely to change. And, and you'll find a piece of head on the road. Now, I learned three lessons about psychology and ethical issues. First lesson, ask, don't tell. Always be alert to his or her need for self-esteem and dignity. Instead of telling your loved one what to do, pose it as a question. Uh, if you want him to do, or her, to do X, ask, well, would you prefer to do X or Y? Knowing in advance that Y isn't going to work. But when he or she chooses X, uh, he or she, she signed on to her program. And it's not you <laughs> mandating this behavior, which Put yourself in a position of a loved one. Uh, the last thing you want to hear is, you do this, you do that. That's uh, not helpful. 
Uh, another self-esteem issue is dealing with the social stigma of Alzheimer's. At first, I only wanted the family to know. Only wanted the family to know. Later, when uh, she declined, she she had to acknowledge that lapses were becoming more noticeable in social situations. So we agreed on a progressively stigmatizing hierarchy of terms, beginning with the least stigmatizing to the most stigmatizing. At the bottom of that hierarchy was, well, she's sometimes forgetful. And, uh, and she always wanted me to use this to cover for her. Uh, it was a little more obvious. Well, she's getting more forgetful these days. That's the next stage. Next stage, well, Dad's been having some memory issues. And finally, uh, dementia. Dad never wanted me to mention Alzheimer's. Uh, early on, I made the mistake of telling one of my friends. And she asked if I had, I had to be honest, and told her I had, and she uh, exploded, just uh, blew apart. So stigma is a, as I'm sure you're already aware, many of you, is a consequential issue. Now, uh, emphasize cognitive exercises. Remember the three exercises that you to go through, you go through physical exercise, primarily for brain circuit, for blood circulation of the brain, social exercise for for the the uh, active, reactive process that your brain goes through, and cognitive exercise. Uh, what, I, what I found, uh, in addition to those exercises, was that it was important to keep her calm if, uh, if she lost her calmness, or maybe, a, say, a loud truck noise or some interruption. Uh, it's difficult for me to, to deal with her for a while. And what I thought worked for me was exercising for still intact, long-term memory. And, and here's what I found useful. My uh, 50s and 60s period music were on the age when uh, of social experiences in the 50s and 60s. Uh, you know, Frank Sinatra and, and, uh, and a whole lot. It, it, uh, I could just see her kind of drifting off with that you know, into the past. Uh, she would repeatedly look at travel and family albums. Uh, she'd go through an album travel and found the album lay it down over there and I said, honey, would you like to look at this one? No, I'm going to look at this one. She just been through it as a new experience for her. And it was, a, it was a very satisfying kind of experience. Uh, listening to a familiar foreign language. Sometimes we watch news in Spanish. And she said, oh, I remember that. And, and, uh, and, and that, that seemed to help. Playing a musical instrument. Uh, we had two pianos. We had one in Arizona and one in New Mexico. And Dan would kind of encourage her to play the piano because it occupied much of her attention between all but the last few months before memory care. And it was a good cognitive exercise. And as long as it lasted, it was uh, it, it was a it was a lifesaver. Uh, maybe in your case, a, uh, a guitar, or a xylophone, a saxophone, whatever you have it, but music, either listening to it or playing, playing it seems to, it has a calming effect. Uh, after she was, um, she would find solace in a piano, uh, she would spend long periods sitting on the couch, staring out at 
the golf course, and the mountains. And I, I think, oh gosh, she's just, she's just bored. And I go over on the shoulder, honey, is everything all right? Oh yes. And she gets back to the surgeries. That was, she was content in that world that she had created. And I'm going to let her stay there. She's more content with the world she created than the one I could create for. The same thing, I had a, not a major, but at least a defined ethical issue, had to do with white lies. Uh, white lies will get you a long ways with an Alzheimer's patient. And I think they're justifiable as a means of control or management. Remember, Entering the Salva daycare, a, uh, just a treasure we have right here in our backyard, for the first time. Right? Fell up to park and, why are we here, Tom? And, well, because we're meeting our friends here. And, oh, that's okay. We go in. That was the first time over. Gee, am I going to have to do this a second time, too? I didn't have to. I pulled up the parking lot and She's out the door. They did such a great job in welcoming her and making her feel, uh, I don't know, I called ahead and said, I'll be there with Diane and made her 10 minutes. So said, we're ready for you. And really met her. Oh, hi, Diane. Why don't we have lunch today? Wow, what a, uh, uh, most people are, are, are so professional, so, so capable. All right, home care. I tried home care, and it wasn't an ideal solution. There, I think the reality is that you pay $25 to $30 an hour, and the person performing the home care gets somewhere between 40 and 60% of that. So you're not, getting, uh, you're not getting highly trained professionals. And because of that, there's a lot of turnover, they do background checks. They're probably pretty safe people. They're not likely to get any chainsaw killers. But uh, there's turnover. So tomorrow's, today's caretaker was not yesterday's uh, caregiver. And that's a, that's a concern. Also, to, uh, to get work done, I had the caregiver come in uh, so I could get some work done. And what I had to do was visibly leave the house and alert the caregiver to distract Diane's attention while I came in another door and snuck to my office and very quietly closed the door. Because otherwise, Diane uh, found me, she would have occupied all of my time and bills wouldn't be paid, investments wouldn't be made, travel wouldn't be done. Uh, United Healthcare, if, you're, uh, if you have Medicare insurance through ARC, you probably have United Healthcare, and if you're under the Medicare Advantage program, and perhaps others that I don't know of, they would send a social worker up to twice a week, and a social worker would handle hygiene, usual problems like dress, and, and, uh, and, uh, giving a shower. It was a big help. Um, all right, now here's a, I didn't know if I should do this or not, I'm going to do it. Uh, this is not an often discussed <coughs> cocktail party conversation, but it may be a very real part of the experience you're having. And I call it the bladder saga. <laughs> I grew when I would shudder at the prospect of stopovers in airport terminals. We were in either New Mexico, Arizona, or North Carolina. So a little bit of air travel about. And picture this scenario. My panic of having to finish peeing in a men's room before I return to the women's restroom the exit across, 
across the across the how about the cutting course, you know, making my way through crowds of people in DFW or Atlanta or Chicago or LA. And I, that was great. I was gonna get lost in that crowd of people. I always told her, wait for me at the National Action when you're done. And she always agreed, but she never did. Because she didn't remember. Uh, had another similar restroom mismatch in Walmart. Have you ever been page at Walmart? <laughs> I have. <laughs> well, you're going to feel the depths of helplessness and frustration you just didn't know were possible. I found, and I'll admit it, I, I, I felt what I called my screen pillow. I would disappear into a closet or a bathroom and just sob, just openly sob, or scream into a pillow. And after 10 minutes, I was fine, come back out, and nobody knew the difference. And I'll just mention in that context, not to solve it one more time, uh, that I carried it good from 9 to 4. It's the best 75 bucks you will ever invest. Mm -hmm. It gives you that break, and uh, you feel a lot better when you come to pick her up than when you felt uh, thinking, uh, leaving your love going off. Now, this, is, uh, this isn't a happy topic. I found some consolation and one comforting thought. That it's, uh, it's a pretty good bet that the first survivor of Alzheimer's is out there somewhere. And it could be your loved one. It's gonna happen. And maybe you'll be, maybe you'll get the brass ring. But in the meantime, I was desperate for a solution, as you may be. If you're like me, you probably thought about putting your loved one into a clinical trial. There's a lot of them out there. And I thought through uh, if I'm ever done in a clinical trial. But prior to doing so, I thought through the pros and cons uh, of it. But the obvious pro is that they're on the right track, and you're not going to the, get the right molecule. And he or she will be better. Uh, here's the cons. Uh, in many cases, uh, location is a problem. Uh, I happen to be close to Charlotte, North Carolina, which is one of the centers that does it. There's only half a dozen locations across the U.S. that do uh, such clinical trials. And if Phoenix is one, well, that's, that's accessible to you. But still, you need travel. The second con was you can't alter your current care program. I ask you, what is your treatment program now? And you tell them she's taking this out of the other supplement. She's on Memetrine and Central. Uh, so don't over that because it'll affect the results of the trial. And that's understandable. I've done that kind of controlled research, and you don't want variables occurring within variables. So, but you're cut off from, they do a trial. And you need a certain sample size for statistical reliability. And let's say it's a, it's a thousand. And that trial results is the, the results of the, what they call the R squared line. You can imagine all these data points up here. This one's really getting better, and this one's not getting so much better over this, this time frame. Uh, what if? Your loved one over that time frame goes from being in a pretty poor shape down here to pretty good shape at the end of the trial, but the trend line shows a failure. That as a group, it was, uh, that, that molecule was deemed ineffective. Now, so there's some that might have gotten a benefit from it. Well, you won't know that because of proprietary information and all the privacy, liability, occurrences come, come into play. 
Another downside is that there's a pretty low probability that any given trial is going to be successful. But you're going to try it anyway because, hey, what if it's a 1% probability? Well, 1%, that's better than zero. But there's a placebo. That 1% now becomes a half percent. And you don't know, nor does the person administering the pill know, which is a placebo and which is a, a controlled drug. Adverse side effects. Uh, the brain is the most complex instrument known in the universe. And it's barely understood. So how do you know that that pharmaceutical's magic molecule wouldn't hit some unintended neurons? Uh, we don't know. In stage three trials, safety is supposed to have been taken out of the equation. But we know how those, uh, those folks can disappear. All right, fourth stage. Where now you're, you've been into post-diagnosis life while uh, you've, you've been suffering. And how do you make the memory care decision? So, <laughs> I was keeping a close eye on Diane, and my family was keeping a close eye on me. And they noticed some troubling trends. That Diane's need for caregiving was going up, and my ability to give care was going down. And they noticed that Dad, that was some time ago, those two lines crossed. And you're uh, You've been on a red work level 24-7 for several years now, and you're in bad shape. <laughs> and they're right. I mean, uh, uh, I've always been moderately active physically, but uh, hiking, which I enjoy once or twice a week, just virtually disappeared uh, on my schedule. A very good friend, an old friend, here in Green Valley, uh, kept my own company on an occasional day when I would go out and like it. Uh, I work on our uh, HOA's ground crews a couple times a week. That gives you some, some physical exercise, but I couldn't leave her. I left her. I would leave her. Uh, initially, I would leave her and come back, and she was fine. And once I came back, and she wasn't there. And we live on a golf course. I just happened to look out the window and there she was halfway across the golf course, almost to the Santa Cruz River. And uh, I realized I had a wanderer. I didn't think she was a wanderer until then. A wandering is, is, is a perfect headache. Uh, gym and cardio workouts were almost impossible. I had had incontinence. I'd be on the electric or the treadmill for a few minutes just getting up to the cardio level. And look at the side and said, do you know where the women's restroom is? Uh, oh, yes. I mean, I'd stop and take her and as soon as you're done, go like back through these doors and I will get back on the treadmill. Running, running, running. I'm thinking, a little bit of time has gone by. She must have been done. And finally somebody would bring her by. And, uh, uh, Hey, we were lucky. We found Diane, and she wanted us to meet you. Uh, we tried to we tried to walk. Uh, we could walk continually, but at Bristol, uh, three and a half to four miles an hour. And as her decline advanced, uh, it was lucky to get a walk in of, of one and a half miles an hour for much more than twenty or thirty minutes. So your, you know, your physical exercise just, just it disappears. We'd be living between New Mexico and Arizona until I needed more help. So I sold New Mexico and moved in 2021 to be with our family in North Carolina. Be with the family was very good for Diane, but both of us missed the Southwest. It doesn't help the washers are going to print it on you, and we wanted to come back. So I returned to Arizona in 
January 2022. And I had this idea. I think uh, I may not be able to live in, the, uh, in our house for much longer, but because we need care, and they've got these CCRCs, these Continuous Care Retirement Centers. And we looked at uh, half a dozen of those, uh, one here in, in La Posada, and uh, about five in Tucson, and four of the five were, were just excellent. And so that was the plan. We move into a CCRC, uh, Diana Resistant Care, me under independent living, but we'd be able to say rope, be able to be in the same room. And then as, when the time came, I thought two, three years later, I would go into memory care at that same facility. Well, something happened between January 2022 last year and March. Some, sometime in that, in that, that short interval, Diane's decline was like the, like the lithium battery You're going down slowly and it just dropped off precipitously and realized that that stage of CCRC just wasn't going to work. Uh, so we had to, uh, finally had to come together and make a decision on two questions. And as a family company, you know, I told my children, uh, it's my wife, but she's your mom. She's been with you all of your lives. She's been with me part of my life. And I really, I didn't want to have any, uh, any regrets. And I realized that no decision could be much worse than what we were going through at that time. So I, I really, I turned it over to you. You'll really have a consensus between the three of you. Fortunately, you're an odd number three. Problems uh, occur with two, four, or six. And the, uh, it was what happened. Uh, first question was, is it needed and when is it needed? Our oldest daughter had spent most recent time with a mom and knew her very well because she lived with us following the divorce. Uh, she really recognized her mother's decline as well as mine failing psychological and physical health. And she was, she said, yeah, mom's ready. Our second daughter had spent less time with her mom and was in partial denial. Oh, isn't it just normal age-related behavior? This took some, some time to convince her otherwise. So I had and had even less chance to closely observe his mother. And he said, well, She's not so bad. Dad can have her just fine. Well, we eventually reached consensus and decided, yes, she's going to memory care, but where? But learn, about, learn about the four S's in memory care facilities. First S is smiles. Both my daughters visited several memory care facilities in the Charlotte, North Carolina area. First of this is smiles. Learn to look for smiles. If you go to a memory care facility and they all look pissed off, that probably is not the one you want to put your loved one into. Second of this is smell. Incompetence is a normal problem that should be cleaned up. If it's not cleaned up, it's a sign that the other hygiene markers are also going to be deficient. Third S, signs. Diane was lucid, uh, and she liked to socialize. Uh, she really enjoyed socializing. So take these numbers. Uh, let's say the population of the memory care facility you're looking at is 10. And that only 10 to 20% of that population is going to be lucid. What does that do to your, your loved one's numbers to socialize one or two others? Uh, find one with a population of 30, uh, there's a lot of advantages, uh, much wider, likely population for socialization. And second, and what 
let's face it, we're not accountants, but uh, 30, 30 payers are going to have a smaller slice of that fixed cost to pay than 10. So the larger the size, the more we can afford to, to give. Finally, the staff ratio, the last, the last yes, staff ratio. We should look for at least three to one, three staff to one patient during waking hours, uh, maybe less during uh, nighttime hours. That seemed, that seemed to be the minimum number for personal attention. All right, so the treatment care decision was made, and since we already had reservations, some of the family and I took Diane on her last trip to the Grand Canyon and Vice Canyon. I picked up the family at the Phoenix Airport, and it was a long drive from the airport to Grand Canyon. I picked them up late in the afternoon, so we stopped in Little America Hotel in Flagstaff to spend the night and drive to Grand Canyon the next morning. I gotta tell you what happened that night. 3 a.m. I was walking out of a sound sleep. The light was on. I saw two people standing there. One was my wife. And I looked a little closer. And one was my daughter. Uh, <clears throat> Diane had gotten up to go to the bathroom at night, and it was a, a strange room. And she opened the wrong door. And she went into the corridor. We were in the second floor. I went down and tried door after door after door. Finally, I didn't find one. Went downstairs and started working the doors on the first floor and found one open. <laughs> and she went in this room and started using the bathroom. Well, the, the couple woke up and uh, naturally surprised. <laughs> I, I talked to them the next day and this is an odyssey. They're a, a Japanese couple. And they're very, very met, went the next morning to apologize. And, and they were just very, very receptive. They couldn't have been nicer. But they called, they called the reception, and the reception found the name of Diane, uh, told the desk that her name was Becker, and they looked for a Becker, and of course what they found was registered under my daughter's name. Our surname. And that was how I found my wife at 3 a.m. in the morning. Uh, it was, I won't say it was funny, but it was, it was tragic, but it, that incident really vindicated our decision. If this is happening now, we made the right decision two weeks ago, and a week from then, she was going into it. All right, but lesson learned. Memory care is expensive. as early as possible, gain the legal right to transfer assets to which your loved one has some or all ownership. Otherwise, those assets can be locked up for a long time and unavailable to help pay for the care of your loved one. Uh, right now, I'm going through that process. I think I only have a couple more months to go. But while you still can, have those assets transferred. So, there's a follow-up question. What are the available solutions when your own level of caregiving ability is falling and your loved one's needs for caregiver rising? Is it only memory care? I'll let you deal with that question momentarily. We're almost done. All right. This stage, I have a memory care, I call this stage memory care limbo. Uh, there are good news and bad news about that new reality. Uh, the good news is the, that consistently, relentlessly, exhausting responsibility of managing those daily crises is finally lifted. Uh, you're, you're, you're free. It's, it's, it's euphoric until the bad news comes to mind. The bad news is that you come to terms with Alzheimer's inevitable curse, and that is 
you and your spouse will never be together again in a shared routine of daily life. No matter how disturbing or difficult managing that daily routine may have become. Right, so I was on a, uh, an emotional roller coaster. You probably would have thought I was on drugs uh, from just uh, uh, almost hallucinatory joy to being free and independent. And then this huge guilt that, uh, thinking back in my case, I think a lot of what drove my uh, decision to uh, ask my wife to marry me was I wanted to be protective. That happens to a lot of guys. I just want to protect. Well, the first time I saw her in memory care, and I, I broke up. I realized I, I just failed to protect. It was a, a massive failure, and so here you are, you're and built, and it's a, uh, it's, but it's tough. And then there's, there's this, uh, you're now, your wife in memory care, your loved one in memory care, you're an awkward, very awkward member of an almost unaccounted social category. Oh, so you're a married single. Yeah, it sounds uh, manageable at the outset, but it's 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 complicated. So, uh, seeing your loved one in memory care really it's, it's a jolting experience. First time I went, I arranged it so that I could see her, but she couldn't see me watching her. And I looked through a window in the garden where Diane was, and and I just lost it. I ran out of the parking lot. I couldn't drive for. 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, it was, it was too disturbing to visit for at least a month. I finally got around to it. But the saving grace of Alzheimer's is that your absence won't be much noticed. And sometimes you visit more for what you think is the right thing to do, or what society thinks is the right thing to do. But if it just tears you up, uh, not visiting isn't going to be very costly to anybody. So the question, what to do if memory care is not within your reach financially? I'll say that. And last, last stage, the sixth stage, uh, life apart and alone. And this is where I was introduced to my new self. Uh, I really had, had booked a, a cruise and for which I couldn't get a refund, but I got a full credit. And I, so I took the cruise. Uh, after that, I had passed on October 8th and I got on board the cruise and went on board on November 4th. And that was a torturous experience. Or it happened to be on a ship we sailed on a couple of times before. And there were just too many familiar sights. And there were too damn many couples holding hands and having dinner together and discussing what, uh, what shore excursion they were going to take. Um, what they're going to have for dinner. I felt really uncomfortable and out of place. Uh, what I did learn is that I become a, a more patient person, more accepting of, of others and the situations they find themselves in. I've got a lot less need to be competitive and be in a chase. I was always in a chase before and everyone was, was running. I can't let that kind of get ahead of me. Well, loneliness, it's inevitable. Uh, it was almost overwhelming for the first few months. Uh, and then you think, well, listen, that's, that's not about feeling sorry for me. There's a whole world out there. So finally you, you, you recenter yourself and focus on something larger than your own grieving. And that new focus, it could be a 
question from some people could be learning a new skill, learning how to play the guitar, the piano, uh, learning fine carpentry, maybe travel. Uh, my own new focus was to do volunteer work. I'm a volunteer for six different organizations which are trying to change the world and fight social injustice to this one way or another. So here's the last question. It's a, it's, a, uh, it's a third of three questions, the first two of which are courtesy of Jerry. Jerry doesn't know this, but a couple of years ago, during a sermon, I was taking notes. I must keep this to take notes. I was taking notes and he was giving sermons of the uh, three important questions of life. And the first two are. What did you do with what you were given? The second question is, who did you do it for? And I've added to Jerry's third question, and mine is, what do you want from the time remaining? What's your answer? Thank you. Yeah, sure. First time, thank you.